Hello everybody, so we are still stuck at home at the moment and even when the world opens up there may be some people who will still be stuck at home because they have mobility issues or they have are in quarantine or whatever. Now there's a lot of people who used to like to go to book readings, say in Barnes & Noble in one of these stores and that is just not happening right now. So what I thought is, well as long as we're stuck at home anyway, how about I bring the book reading to you? And what I will be reading today will be from The Aeon. It's one of my favorite books, The Aeon by Jay Newell. And there's a reason why it is one of my favorite books. And it starts a little bit um, depressing in a way because it um, starts describing the characters in the book as people who have a little bit of an issue at the moment in their lives. And then they come together and it's a little bit of a firework when they come together. But throughout the book, there's a transformation, pretty much everyone in the book, which is really, really interesting. I think you will find it interesting as well. So I'm starting with the first chapter. This is dedicated to Kay. And the first chapter is called Benign Misfits. So let's start. Dawn hung like a heavy mist over the city when Mac left. He did not see the thin speck of red on the horizon behind him, growing into a wondrous spectacle of colors, changing from minute to minute, from soft lilac to bright orange to baby chick yellow, spreading across the opal sky, chasing away the demons and fears of the night. Mac wanted to hold on to his demons. They were all he had left from the life he knew. And he was not yet ready to die to himself and rise from the ashes to a new life. It would have taken the pain away, at least for a while, but it would have also buried what he loved forever in the past. And he was not yet ready to commit what felt like the ultimate betrayal, to accept what had been done as if somehow his acceptance justified the acts of injustice and heartlessness and blindness. Mac did not care anymore for the sakes that, for their sakes, that they were blind. It was not a blindness that had been born with, something that they couldn't do anything about or what have been... Sorry, this is my little kitten down here is uh, playing with the microphone. Mac did not care anymore for the sakes, for their sakes, that they were blind. Mac did not care anymore for their sakes that they were blind. It was not a blindness that they had been born with, something that they could do nothing about or that had been done to them by disease or accident. It was something they did to themselves, something parents taught their children, something that made it easier for them to live their egocentric lives without the encumbrance of compassion or conscience. They were of course missing out on being able to feel the purest of joy, the mere essence of life. But that was what they chose in order to protect their hearts from hurt. He could almost understand this fear, this perceived trade-off of ultimate joy against being safe from ultimate sorrow. What bothered him more than he could stand though was that they destroyed what they could not perceive. Maybe it was mere clumsiness, but he somehow doubted that. The attacks were too vicious and too directed for that. It felt more like jealousy, as if, if I can't have it, nobody else should, sort of drive, fed by the lingering vacuum inside that was left by this shutting out of life by pretending not to see it and succeeding. The anger that this vacuum couldn't be filled by their own safe, synthetic, choices of fun, which had never led to true joy, but at most to a hectic activity fo followed by a form of contentment that came with tiredness, but never more. They could not see anymore to ever get filled up again to the brim, except in those rare moments when they couldn't evade life, like shortly after surviving mortal danger or when propagating their own amputated species, with, which were the moments when they exclaimed that they knew something now that nobody else did. When they proclaimed themselves wise as if having found the Holy Grail. Because then they did sense that there was more out there. That those 
they looked down on as inferior, had something they would never be able to regain. And being bested by the young and so supposedly weak was not something they could bear. So they destroyed and hurt those who felt more than they did, so they themselves would feel strong again. And thus they spread over the planet like a parasite, a plague that destroyed everything in its path. There were others, Magnu, freak mutations who had been born with the full ability to perceive and who had survived in society without being numbed. Pretenders who managed to survive the hurt, who managed to develop and put on personalities to fit in without losing themselves. They were frequently loners even when they were not pronounced freaks because it took time and effort to save and regain the self after a prolonged period of fitting in. Society would reward their pretense by giving them leeway to be odd at occasions. Sometimes they managed to save lives. More often they didn't. Some gave up because it hurt more when one cared and they argued that it was futile to try and help as one could never save them all. Some lost patience and tried to force society through violence. He could understand how the latter group felt. Anyone who has seen his loved ones being hunted, mutilated and killed would know this feeling that they just had to make it stop right now. But you couldn't fight the enemy by becoming the enemy. And violence would just give the enemy legitimacy in the eyes of those who still had a speck of feeling left. And as they were so overpowering in numbers, it was more effective to make the enemy your friend and show them what they were missing out on, while putting the prospect of regaining it in front of them, like a carrot in front of a donkey. So that they imagined doing the right thing was, doing, was their own idea. As for the former, he did understand the weariness. But becoming blind yourself didn't make the problem go away. Maybe saving one tiny soul really didn't make a difference in the greater scheme of things. But it sure made a difference to that particular soul. And who knew what the soul would set in motion? A butterfly's wings in A could cause a storm halfway around the globe in B, after all. But for now, Mac just needed to get away. His energies were drained. He was ready for a small wonder to restore his soul. And so is my little lovely back here. The moon shone bright, shone bright this night, and left pretty silvery streaks in the sky where it touched the feathery clouds of the parting day. Avanka had to close her eyes at the brilliance of its touch which caressed every fold and flexing this tall, of this tall stranger's muscles as she lay in the grass silently watching his every move. It had been the most unusual sight when he arrived on the small clearing. That was her escape at night. At first she thought he was talking to himself and she realized that two little bear cubs were sneaking around his ankles, frightened at the sound of the night. There were heavy scratches on the man's arms, as if the mother had tried to stop him taking the cubs. But he hadn't enough strength enough left to really fight. Avanka had only contempt for men who thought they had to prove their prowess and manliness by hunting animals that could not hurt anyone. She shivered at the memory of what had been done two weeks ago. The delight in the young village man, men's eyes at the lioness's agony when they had mortally wounded her. She whose only fault was to try and protect her young against this mob of naked viciousness. Avanka could not understand how anyone could think of themselves as brave for attacking something that was weaker than him, especially when they used far-reaching weapons. Not that it would have made any, it any better if one of them had killed the mother with, with his bare hands, but at least Avanka would have understood the twisted and ill-conceived notion of bravery, even if completely misplaced. The truth was that they hunted the beast from far away, where it never had any chance to catch them, and they were never in any danger on par. But even those who were not completely dead inside would not bring themselves to open their mouths when they saw this injustice. They were too afraid of being ridiculed by their peers. 
And so they took part, some of them shouting victory the loudest to drown out their own conscience and feeling of cowardice. They said that man was superior to the beast. Well, then pick on your own kind, not those below you. Cowards, all of them. The more viciously a man hunted, the more certain it was that he had a tiny piece. Someone who is something doesn't need to pick on the weak to make himself feel strong. She was sure. When Haras had joined them and come back with shining eyes to brag in front of her of his great accomplishment, he had thought that she would fall for him now, that he had her. How deadly wrong he had been. Her love for him had died in that instance. And he would never, ever be desirable in her eyes again. It so hurt that she had lost the man she thought would be her partner in life. But now she knew he had never existed. Horace had just pretended to be that man for a while. He was never it. And now he was wallowing in self-pity, never a thought for the life he had destroyed because he thought of it as inferior with no rights, therefore his pleasure not to be pitied. Well, he wouldn't be pitied either, at least not by her. He had got far less than he had deserved. She had to drag herself away from getting lost in this path of thought. It still entranced her, made her sick. It was difficult to let go of the injustice of it all. They had left the cubs to die miserably. She had spent hours, days in the woods trying to find them, but they had just laughed at her when she tried questioning them where they had left them, told her she was weak to bother about them. But compassion was never a weakness. Closing oneself to the hurt it brings in order to appear strong was. It wasn't strength when you didn't feel anything anymore, just as it wasn't bravery when you were too stupid to be afraid. It just gave the appearance of strong to those who didn't know the real thing. And it showed a lack of character. Fear to see reality, that was all. An inability to deal with the things life brings. They were parading their fear and weakness like a prize and were offended when she didn't praise them for it. But this one seemed different. He didn't close himself to the life around him. Instead, he embraced it. The mere sight of a soul like this stimulated and excited her. He was the prospect of someone who could let himself go in his entirety, merge completely, not only with his body but with his soul. A completeness like this, such radiance, permeated every aspect in life. From the most simple to the most intimate moments, she wished Haras had ever been like this, that she had he had been someone who was capable of letting go and letting life in. Excitement had never ever meant more to Horace than the stupendous one-dimensional pumping that everybody considered great lovemaking in some parts. But if you shut out the life to act strong like he did, you can't expect to be great in the ultimate act of giving life, can you? Unfortunately, this stranger was way beyond her reach and her league at the moment. She was way too young for him to be able to be a proper partner, but she realized that it was these qualities he had that he had been, that she had been missing in her previous partners. So it existed, it was out there. He was someone with real strength, someone who rated charisma as much as his muscles were gleaming with the sweat of exertion, someone who made his own way in life, who didn't care what society said but not in a bad egoistic way, this usually implies. He was someone who didn't only fight when his own rights were in danger, but when he truly fought for the rights for those who couldn't help him in return. There was a haunted look in his eyes that spoke of a man's pain endured, but at the same time, these eyes made you believe that they had come out stronger at the end, if chipped at the edges. He was a picture of manliness, and the gentle, gentleness with which he tra treated the little cubs just reinforced his mental warrior side. He was walking to the stream now to fill his water bottle and replenish his supplies. And she realized that her soul was starved for a complete soul to share with. 
Oh, how she wished to be older at that moment. She imagined how, oops. <laughs> you imagine it as well, don't you? Hmm? And she, oh, how she wished to be old at this moment. She imagined how it could have been with Harris if he had possessed a little bit of the stranger's qualities. But men like that didn't exist very often, certainly not in her age group. And if they did, they would only like other men. Not, nothing against being that way, save that it made them unavailable to her. Could be great friends, though. And that was, after all, the most important part in a relationship. Ah, what noble thoughts, and all true. Only that it didn't address a certain need in a part of her anatomy. Sure, infatuation only lasted a couple of months when played out, and then it was usually over, but it lingered forever when not gratified and took up all the space in one's life. So it couldn't be ignored. Or these perfect men were married and monogamous. She wouldn't make love with someone who had promised to be only with one woman. Although she didn't subscribe to the idea of possession herself, she respected when others did. It wasn't really the physical act that made love making with someone outside the relationship cheating and so destructive. It was the betrayal of trust, the breaking of a promise, especially when the other side had labored hard to keep that promise. Although she hadn't given that promise herself, she didn't like to play a part in the breaking. No man with that qualities of the stranger would not exist for her for a long time. He was just too perfect. Well, no harm done by studying his qualities for a little bit longer so she would know what she was looking for. He left the clearing now, trailed by the cubs and Ivanka. Session number two of the Aeon. A book reading, again, for those who are stuck at home for whatever reason. Jack walked home alone. It wasn't as if he hadn't planned or indeed looked forward to a nice, exciting, long night out in the buzz of the city with his friends enjoying a break from his efforts, which usually left him too tired to think of anything but going home to sleep. But as it turned out, he didn't have any friends. Again. Not that it was a big surprise, it always turned out this way sooner or later, especially with those sheep-like characters who valued not standing out and being like everyone else, like nothing in the world. He wasn't like everybody else. But contrary to them, he thought it was a good thing. He thought for himself, he didn't throw stones with a mob. When he didn't know if the crime had been committed, he didn't parrot every rumor and every age-old wisdom like everybody else without thinking about the validity. Age-old wisdoms had their reasons, yes, but often these reasons were all by good ones. Oftentimes they had strong had suppressed the weak and they made a rule out of it to justify and solidify their position. Or the reason for the rule was long gone, but everybody still hung on to the rule, praising it as the best since scrambled eggs for breakfast. Like the rule that you were lazy if you didn't get up before dawn. Yes, of course, that rule used to have a reason when everybody around was a farmer and there was no mechanism to produce enough light to illuminate the fields yet. If a farmer didn't get up before dawn, he couldn't start working at first light and would therefore be able to put in less hours before sundown than the other one who did. But most people were living in the city now. The art of artificial light was long managed. People would be able to work in most jobs until long after dark. Indeed, a lot of jobs had to be carried out during the night anyway, especially when they had to be done outside. The sun had long grown too fierce to let anyone survive for long in its heat. That was the population's fault. But instead of inventing a rule to reverse the process, they had let this to, they, that had led to the situation, people went on with their lives the same way, laughing about those who tried to make an effort, while holding on to the stupid rule of having to get up early. If you got up at midday and worked to midnight, you worked as many hours or more as if you got up at dawn and quit at midday, but people would just not get that. 
A rule was a rule and that was that. And God forbid you should actually think about what you were doing instead of slavishly following their example. Of course, it didn't help if you pointed out people's stupidity to them. Apart from being very unpopular yourself, people would just hold on tighter to their convictions just to be right. And who were you anyway to point out their mistakes? <sighs> that the reason you were doing this was that holding on to this rule was now hurting everybody was immaterial. They were just too short-sighted to see that and those who could see would close their eyes and for, wait for someone else to do something. Because what did it matter what one person did anyway in the great scheme of things? A nice excuse. Also, there was the small matter that they bossed you around with this eternally senseless rule because of course the rule the, the rules they chose to uphold were the rules that gave them a reason to feel superior towards you. It was never about truth or even decency. It was always about the old, I am better than you and the rule proves it. It was just a tool to put someone else down and to not feel so inferior because they knew damn well that they were acting like sheep. No offense against the actual animal. Only very seldom was there the occasion where all of a sudden someone would quote him and then sell the idea as his. But he was happy with that, as long as there was an occasional success for the truth. But tonight hadn't been about that. His decision early in life to think for himself had led him to different choices than others made. And now he was different. Not that he minded himself, but there were only a very few people who could deal with that sort of thing, usually those who were different than themselves. The others would call him antisocial because he didn't do what they expected. He wouldn't bow to the tyranny of their whims. Not that it was true that he was antisocial. He actually did more for others than they ever would, but they were better at selling themselves. They never did anything good if it didn't make them look generous or or socially superior, they would give with one hand and would take away with the other when nobody was looking. In short, they were highly unsocial frauds. And a fraud never likes to be found out. And he certainly does not like to find someone who is actually the real thing. Gives because he wants to do good and help others. Because that makes himself look bad. And frauds band together. And they are a cowardly bunch. They're usually weak, so they only attack in packs when they can be sure that they won't be hurt back. And when it is too dangerous to do that, they display their tolerance. Jack knew all that, but he had momentarily forgotten in his desire for real company. He had been lulled in by their apparent friendship and kindness, and now it was the same all over again. And not that they had actually physically attacked him, nothing that obvious. Oh, not. They just talked about him behind his back. And when he went to look at one of the many stands of fine pottery, they had just accidentally lost him. Giggling to themselves about their smartness of getting rim rid of him without openly breaking social rules. And more importantly, without submitting themselves to a possible counterattack. They had actually been far less smart than they thought, as he had watched the whole huddle scene unfold in the mirror that they hadn't noticed, and they didn't know about the keenness of his hearing and his ability to read lips. But he doubted they actually cared, as long as they were able to pretend that it was an accident. If they stuck together, it didn't matter if he knew. They would just lie again and pretend that he was being so unsociable and paranoid that he would accuse them falsely and that they would never, never do such a thing. There was a time when he had believed such stories, when he couldn't imagine that someone would actually scoop, stoop down to those levels, when he felt ashamed of having been so paranoid and having done them such harm. It was only when he started lying himself, way in his adulthood, that he understood their thinking. And it had been a painful process to realize how they had used his trust and his willingness to believe in the good in them against him. It had taken a long time for him to be able to trust them, at least with little things, and he never ultimately did. And 
Sadly enough, he was right. He just hoped that those experiences wouldn't make it impossible for him to see when he actually met a real person. Well, at least he had learned to manipulate those frauds for his own purposes now when he concentrated on it. The last few days he had slipped and as a result he was walking home, walking home again. And as a result he was walking home alone again. Oh well, their friendship tonight would just have been an illusion anyway, and a shallow one at that. He really had to get away to somewhere where it was more likely he would meet real people where he would be home and would be able to finally relax and enjoy himself, like years ago. Yes, he really needed to get far, far away from this. And suddenly, in an instant, he got what he wished for. And Farah. Farah sighed. This was the third time the charm didn't work and the milk got sour and nothing else. If only her grandfather had devoted more time to developing a sound theory. <sighs> Instead of taking the shortcut over mouse blood and eel's eye. Yes, like all shortcuts, it gave results in the short run. But there were always repercussions and you ended up with more of a mess than before, in addition to having wasted time and resources. But her grandfather had been short-tempered and his nagging feeling of inadequacy had driven him to present results so that he would be praised. He knew what would eventually come out of it. But he also knew that most would not understand the connections so that he presented what he presented were mirages, potions that worked for a while and then took a terrible toll. The momentary adoration and praise were enough for him and the sweats he woke up with at night in the beginning soon ceased and he would even sleep through the night and occasionally convince himself that he was doing it all for a good cause. But you didn't mess with the goddess forever. Our solar years were only a blink of an eye to her and now she had devoted real time to teach him the errors of his ways beginning with reincarnating him as every one of his innocent victims in turns. She could do that. You didn't have to believe in reincarnation to be reincarnated. It was enough that reincarnation believed in you. Time wasn't an obstacle for a goddess. And Farah had to admit that there was some poetic justice to the fact that he was repeatedly torturing himself in another form in order to be praised and that once he would come out of the cycle, he would be born again into a time where his fraud had long been discovered and where his name and the names of those like him were used to express disgust. And he would remember it all. It is said that the worst thing that can befall a man is to get to know himself. And it is the worst for those who have smothered the conscience the longest. And as a special treat, the souls of those who tortured, who he tortured, would be his direct superiors in one form or another for lives to come, without knowing it, only with the slightest taste for his person. The goddess wasn't without humor. Hmm. Farah had lost track of him now, but she could still sometimes feel him squirm. It made her feel slightly uncomfortable, but not more than that. The goddess taught to love your family and your elders. But as opposed to other cults, the love need not to be blind. Yes, there was an assumption that your elders were wise and that they deserved respect. But one didn't need to close one's eyes to the fact that it was possible to live a very long time indeed without learning anything wise at all. Wisdom can only come when there is a latent desire to find the truth. But some people never want to know the truth and it is often uncomfortable and the older they get the more they just repeat this, those old sayings that will for some reason favor them. If they naturally get up early they will wisely remark how early risers are better than those sleeping longer and working longer. If they are naturally afraid of new things or too lazy or too rigid to adjust they will praise the good old days and how everything was purer and better then. 
There usually wasn't much wisdom in this. Some things had been better then, some things were worse. It was just justification, justification for what they were, not more. But every once in a while, you could find a gem within all those platitudes, a sign that the person had lived and learned something true and valuable that hadn't found its way in the dead net of never changing. And it was worth looking out for those gems amongst the rubble. Some people had more, some less. And every once in a while you would meet an old person whose soul would gleam in the sun with gems that, will cha that still changed and adjusted to the new. Those people were very rare indeed and of more worth than tens of the best and most innovative youngsters together. Another reason to respect the old by default was the assumption that they had created something of worth in their time. Maybe they had managed to bring up children to be good people, which mostly benefited themselves as a child was really seen as an extension of themselves, but nevertheless the child might also help others. Maybe they had left a work of art to bring joy to all. It was the assumption that most people had accomplished something worth of worth in their life something that benefited the community. But of course, that assumption could be proved wrong. Some people had such a nasty effect on everybody around them that they had wasted their lives and made everybody and everybody else worse. Those elders didn't need to be revered. So both assumptions that elders had accumulated wisdom and that of elders having created value could be proven wrong. That didn't mean you were necessarily supposed to despise and look down on those elders, but you didn't have to give into the exaggerated demands for respect either. You reap what you sow. All that was left was the sadness of a wasted soul, because all those souls could have excelled. They made a wrong choice early in life and never recovered from it. Her grandfather had been like that. First, she had still tried to make him love her and what was around him had thought it was a failure of herself when he did not respond with kindness. Then she had hated him for all the hurt he brought to her by hurting those she was connected with. Now there was only the lingering sadness of what could have been. You could still see the potential that was once there, but that had been bent and cracked beyond description, sprouting malice at every self-inflicted wound. But it wasn't her problem anymore. She had done what she could and only the goddess could forge and change, break and mend a soul like that back together. No sense of fretting about it. She had her own soul to attend to and the soul of all the members of her congregation in the lands. And she had to attend to her students, those learning to navigate the aeon, the net connecting every consciousness in the universe. The connections her first graders built were getting stronger now. She could feel the pulse of the net grow as people connected, this time consciously and not only in dreams. She could feel how the strength in one link overflowed to the next, how the ones connected started to avoid acts of destruction that weakened creation, but how they also learned to cut old bonds that had lost their purpose. Most could only sense those knots in their immediate surroundings, which rep represented another life. It was funny to watch how they realized that physical distance was no obstacle to the connection, neither was the matter of species. How it sometimes even made it stronger. How they could use the knowledge to reinforce the links without creating an imbalance in the system. It had been hard work to get to this point, but even if it all collapsed now, it had been worth every minute of its existence. Farah didn't dare to build for the future anymore. Life was too unpredictable and to anchor your net in the future just meant that it was cut too often and you had to start all over again. She still pointed her efforts towards a goal in the future to make sure that there was the possibility of growth. But now the things she needed to have a meaning in the present this way but now the things she needed, she did needed to have, but now the things she did needed to have a meaning in the present. This way, even if it all collapsed, some worth still remained. 
And if it was only that her soul and those of the others were more intact now than they would have been without the effort. If the connection stayed intact, however, she had something solid to build the future on. If you only lived to achieve what you were seeking in the future without enjoying the road, chances were that you wouldn't be satisfied even when you achieved your goal. And that it would collapse like a card house and leave you empty as soon as a little wind came blowing away. This was different. It had real meaning in the now. Farah closed her eyes and let her soul soar freely. Hello, welcome back. Now we are still at the Aeon and um, this is chapter two. So just as a recap, we have met four characters in chapter one, all in their own little world. Uh, one was um, Avanka, the little girl. The one was Mac, the one in the beginning, the tall stranger. The next one was um, Jack who had just had a bad experience with his friends, and then there was Farah, the priestess. So now we're coming to the second chapter, and um, I have the feeling that maybe they will meet. So, the second chapter, The Gathering. Avanka had been sure she hadn't made a sound. She was a superb tracker. Nothing as vulgar as a broken twig would announce her presence not even in the state of her present excitement. But there she was, with a sword in her face. He had come out of nowhere. Being careful not to come too close, she had only lost sight of him for a few seconds, and then all of a sudden there was the Stratton running her way with his lowers antled at full speed. Very odd for a Stratton to behave that way, and it astonished her that she hadn't sensed him before. So she jumped the nearest tree and pulled herself up just long enough that the Stratton would rush through underneath. She carried a knife, but apart from it being dangerous to attack such a big animal with it, she didn't want to hurt him if it wasn't absolutely necessary for her survival. Even when they attacked animals, they reserved the same consideration as kids and disturbed people. You know, one just couldn't take an eye for an eye and kill the attacker. One had to cut them a little slack as they didn't know better. Being more gifted in one area like intelligence did not bring a certain not only bring a certain superiority in that area, but it also carried with it the responsibility to protect and lead those not quite so blessed. It did not give the right to do as one pleased and use the gift for one's own benefit only. A gift wasn't something one owned. It was given by the goddess for a specific purpose, and it was it was very seldom an egocentric one from the perspective of one so gifted. So far so good. Now she had been hanging from that twig, which broke and sent her down sprawling to the ground and of course making a lot of noise. She had jumped up to see where to hide next to avoid the next pass, but the Stratton was gone, vanished into thin air. Instead, when she turned around, she found a sword pointed at her nose. And at the end of it, the stranger she had followed. The cubs were nowhere in sight. Why are you following me? Uh, said Ivanka eloquently. This was very embarrassing. What was she supposed to say? Because you're so very interesting? Oh, it wasn't an option. Um, I saw you with those cubs and I wanted to make sure that they were all right and you didn't just leave them to die or worse, she managed instead. Well, it was true also. There wasn't a rule that you had to tell people everything about you in the first sentence after all. So you care about a couple of bear cubs? Well, maybe you do, but why don't you do something about the traps then? They're all over the place. Their mother got caught in one. She's been trapped there for so long that I don't know how if I can save her. Anger and deep frustration could be heard in his tone or voice. But, I mean, what am I supposed to do? The fighters in my village set the traps. I'm the only one against it. I've been arguing for years that they shouldn't do that. It's not as if they needed the hides after all. It's just a sort of sport for them. Avanka felt deeply ashamed of her people at this point. The stranger had to think they were barbarians. She saw the fury in his eyes, although he was obviously struggling to keep his face blank. Ah, so you've talked. 
Let me guess, no one listened to you and you feel deeply sorry for yourself that you're being made fun of, but you have never actually tried to tra take the traps away or make it seem it caught a twig by mistake. Because if they caught you, there, there would be trouble for you. Well, they wouldn't actually hurt you physically, at least not badly, but they would be upset with you and tell you what a bad girl you are. You don't want to risk that, so you just stand by and do nothing. This was really unjust. Who do you think you are to judge me like that? Avanka blurted out. Do you have any idea of what my life has been like? I'm the only one who says anything. The only one who doesn't dull herself to the hurt. I know damn well that I won't help, that they won't change, but I argue and argue anyway. People think I like to argue. <sighs> but I don't. I hate it. I love harmony. I'd much rather be friends with everyone, but I just can't keep my mouth shut when I see injustice. And so I keep arguing. And so there's no one who has the slightest understanding for how I feel. That also means that I'm alone. I don't have any friends. People make fun of me and play tricks on me. They all think it's just little things, but altogether it's a constant stream of viciousness that wears me down. I'm so tired. Tears were standing in her eyes now. She was aware that she sounded pathetic, but she couldn't help it. Yes, I haven't killed them in revenge. I haven't stood in the bushes and killed them before they killed the innocent. But I happen to be a pacifist. I don't think that violence is the answer. There was at last some defiance in her stance. The stranger let her speak her piece. She wasn't quite sure how he was taking it. His face had become unreadable, although she thought that she saw some softness in his features. Or was it pity? Pity for this pathetic little girl who thought that she sacrificed so much but really did nothing? I didn't say you were supposed to kill them, he said, studying her closely. You're right. Killing isn't the answer. It just makes you more like them, although they, of course, wouldn't see it that way. You can be a pacifist and still be active beyond words. And words are clearly not enough. You see that yourself. Taking it all makes you a victim, not a pacifist. It also doesn't help the animals one bit. Pacifism isn't about being passive, about assuming the same victim stars as the real victim. Pacifism isn't about a lack of courage. A pacifist doesn't refrain from attacking because he is afraid, but because he thinks attacking is the wrong way. But that doesn't mean a pacifist doesn't have other options. Use your intelligence. Here, let me show you. The stranger turned his way, his back, and walked away. He didn't check that she was following him, so she hurried to keep pace with him. And then, just like that, a big something fell out of the sky. Jack could still remember the last conversation with her before the breakup as if it was yesterday. You did know that I showed you my cabin like that on purpose, right? How you interpret what you saw in there just says as much about you as the state of the cabin says about me. Oh yeah, I agree. I showed you that you're a lazy slob and that I'm tidy and organized. It shows that I got off my butt and keep my surroundings clean while you drop everything where you stand. If you take a good look around, you would see that it was indeed clean. But yes, there's a lot of stuff lying around. That's just what happens when you own a lot of stuff. I don't spend every waking minute trying to impress my neighbors. I spend my time instead trying to do something good. Well, you could start with throwing away half of what you own. And that was the point when he had realized that they had nothing in common. Oblivious to what just happened. She glared in an awkward pause with triumph in her eyes, not realizing that his argument had been about winning some domestic contest, but that even while arguing, he had tried to find a bridge between them, and that her careless remark, innocent as it seemed, had just proved that there was none. They could just as well have lived in two different universes, and in a way they did. You know, it is true that the way people live, at least when they are old enough to not just mimic what they were taught, but when they have developed their own style, says something about the person, says something about their mind, he said. But there are different ways to interpret what you see. When you look at my cabin, you could see that I have a wealth of different interests. 
that I treasure things and ideas. We organize them and try to build something beautiful with them instead of discarding them when they have lost their worth. You could see a creative mind that tries to build, not destroy. But you just repeated what you have heard others say. You didn't look for the truth. You took one look at the cabin and saw it wasn't up to other standards and you thought you could feel all superior. She snorted in a vile show of amusement that made her look so ugly that he wondered how he could ever have noticed, not have noticed that trait in her before. Yes, you are what others call tidy to a fault, he had continued. Nothing is lying around anywhere. Your cupboards are almost empty and someone who is visiting would never be able to guess that you're interested in anything. But that's just it, isn't it? You aren't interested in any, anything. Your empty rooms are a perfect mirror for your empty soul. Everything that just gets in your way of your perfect order gets destroyed or discarded. Everything, everywhere you go is just a little bit more empty after you've left. And you don't stop at destroying life when it's too stupid to get in your way either. Because life isn't orderly. Life is messy. It starts things, it starts something else before the first is finished, goes off on a tangent and then picks up the first thing again and uses it and weaves it into a work of art with all the leftover strands it had left flying before. Life is constant improvisation and creation. It abandons things when they don't lead anywhere anymore, but it doesn't discard them. It just waits until another thread shows up, an opportunity to use it again to build a work of art, a work of art much more wondrous and full than anything that was carefully planned and constructed from the start could ever be. He paused, realizing from the blank look in her eyes that his passion was falling on dead ground, that it only left him open and vulnerable. He could just as well have talked to a wall. He shifted gear and finally stood up, st uh, stooped down to her level because that was the only thing she understood. She would only have interpreted his speech as a desperate plea otherwise. She didn't understand that people sometimes didn't hit back full strength, not because they couldn't, but because they didn't think it to be the right way, as in no constructive way, and that the temperance of oneself was strength in itself. All she understood was destruction. That was what she was. That was what she interpreted as strength. And oddly enough, as good. He contemplated letting it lie, but he, res he resented letting a bully win. It just made them repeat their actions with new fervor next time, while a bloody nose wouldn't lead them to be able to see. But at least next time they would be more cautious. They wouldn't beat the next li live soul quite so much without any concern. What your room says about you is that you're dead inside, he continued. You're as hollow as a tomb and your empty rooms mirror that. You hate life and you wish to destroy any sign of it wherever you go. You call it order, but all it is is a fear of life, a frightening ability, inability to adjust. Moreover, the fact that you think you have the right to command me to throw away half my stuff shows that you think you have the right to act like a dictator. That you have the right to bully others into being like you. You don't. And I'd rather die than be a zombie like you. I wouldn't mind about you because you have brought this upon yourself with your concern of appearances and superficial things. What I do mind is that you bring destruction to everything that lives around you in the name of order. Any plant, any worm adds more good to the world than you do. He noted with an empty satisfaction that her smile had disappeared from her face. I see you're finally hearing me. And I'm sure you will be extra destructive towards anything alive from now on just to get back at me. Just as the coward you are. But you would do that anyway, just as you have always done. At least I won't be around to see it. He felt a pang of regret that his careless words would almost certainly bring suffering to a helpless creature at her hands in the near future. But there was nothing he could do about that anymore. I'll send you whatever I can find of yours in my place. I'm sure it's all neatly packed together. And I don't want to see you again. And yes, I mean it. He had turned and walked away. 
and he hadn't cared about the look of disbelief on her face, the wondering of how she could have lost control of her little pet so entirely. He had known she would soon wear a tight-lipped, snug smile on her face, just knowing that he would come crawling back. He had known that she would feel all superior for three weeks or so, when she would call him and tell him in superior tone that she, usually the teacher, had got it now, that he could crawl back now, that she would concede his small victory and take him back, being proud that her pet had at least shown a little backbone. And then she would realize slowly that it might really be over. And then she would draw out her chest of manipulations to draw him back in, would promise to be open. But he knew that if he went back, that she would be reverted right back to what she was once he was securely in her crutches. Clutches. She hadn't realized that it wouldn't be this way, not this time. He had felt surprised at the elation he felt. The feeling of weight had been lifted off his shoulders, as if angels were singing in jubilation because he had finally escaped his cage. He had realized one wasn't supposed to feel this way after breaking up. A several year long relationship, but it didn't matter. For three days he had been walking on clouds afterwards. And when he finally came down again, it wasn't because of her desire or any desire he had to get back to her. He had moved on, the cord was severed. All this was very well, but if being sucked into a vortex-like hole that appeared out of nowhere, like in your average science fiction movie, and being dropped off on the other side without a parachute 20 meters above the tallest tree, whatever the other side was, odd colors for a forest, by the way, meant that your life flashed before your eyes, he would have wished for a nicer, more exciting stretch of his life. Like that moment he saw that moonfish or the wreck dive in Bali, even one of the spectacular skiing accidents would have done, but he guessed he couldn't be picking while the be picky while the trees were rushing towards him at one kilometer a second. Ah! He heard himself screaming while thinking so much for famous last words. He tried to clutch at the twigs rushing past. Well, at least it's going to be a short and mm. it said. Avanka prodded it experimentally with her foot. The tiny seed was flowing on a pool of water. For it, the splash could just as well have been the ocean. So grand did it seem, so lost was it in its arms, lost but comfortably so. No burdens, no restrictions, no expectations, except to be and dance to the waves and be receptive. It could, of course, refuse input and stay the way it was, and it would still be okay, at least for a while. It would go on, just like it was. The universe was forgiving for a while when you were afraid of change. But then gradually it would spoil and go sour, and its ocean would become a pond, and after a while it would become a splash, and it wouldn't run on ground and start to choke like the others. Of course the others pointed out to it how nice it was that they knew just everything in their little world, that they were no surprises, except for the ugly ones, that they couldn't be avoided. And were greatly lamented, but that otherwise nothing ever changed, and at least not as far as you would notice. Of course, he had not seen their ponds and splashes, because he was just only concerned to be to their souls, but connected to their souls, but somehow their descriptions didn't quite seem to match the state of their souls. Why did their world seem so oppressive? Why did sharing with them always bring it down instead of uplift it, although it felt such great familiarity with their worlds? Why did they seem so desperate to make it choose their fate to the point of downright blackmail? Was it really concern? Sometimes it tasted almost like, well, something very dark that ate away at them and they tried very hard to hide it. It was like a shadow on their soul. It couldn't imagine what they were feeling so darkly about. After all, they had what he had, only they were so much bigger. When they said it was so much better because it was, it made them wiser. But then again, they said they longed to be young again and swim in their ponds or even ocean. But then they could still do that if they hadn't refused input. If they had made their oceans grow when it was time, 
when it was time. Maybe it wasn't time anymore. But how could it run out? There seemed to be plenty of it for him, for them. It glowed like a rainbow, glittering, streaming past, bringing all kinds of exciting patterns and the occasional sting. What was that again? A rainbow stream. It hurt somewhere, right? It was one of those things time brought, had washed over him like a beautiful wave, had filled him to the brim with excitement, danced around him, showed him all sorts of entrances to other worlds, other lives, filled him up with joy. He liked time. It brought new input, new excitement, like that rainbow stream. But the others seemed to stay out of it, its flow as much as they could. Avoid anything that could make their little splashes change to ponds again. And they certainly didn't want to become an ocean. They said they were too tired to swim in the ocean. Well, no wonder. If you have to been beached so long that all your extremities have become small. Oh yes, and that rainbow stream had brought him the awareness that the, he had a choice. He could be a he or a she, whatever that was. For now, he had decided to be a he. It was shorter, less complicated. For as long as he was so busy streaming with time. What a ride! He sensed the amusement of the others, but then again, there was this dark feeling behind it. He could see that it would be released and would, and would free them if they rode with him, but they said that they couldn't. And anyway, they were way too grown up to do that. It seemed to be a dreadful thing, this grown up. It would look rather like dead to him. But did he know dead from again? Right. It had been that thing that didn't move anymore. It was like a little pattern, a mosaic in time. It looked quite pretty, but he felt rather sad that it couldn't change itself anymore. It was locked, locked in time. On the other hand, it was also saved by time in a way, the way it was. He thought it would please the others because they were always so ready to point out to him that change was bad. But for some reason, the state of no change at all scared them too. Curious that. It wasn't that different from the state they were in anyway. A few of them occasionally dangled their feet in the water of the stream and claimed that they had stayed young. He felt that was rather odd because they were just as immobile as the others. They never really swam. They just stole little trophies from the stream. Stole little and on occasionally big pieces away from those that still swam. Creepy that. He would stay away from them. Why didn't they just push off like those they got the pieces from instead of staying beached and stealing? They seemed to think that they were clever because they only took what they liked instead of swimming with it all, but they didn't seem to realize that what they took out died as soon as they had snatched it out of the stream. Or they did realize, but they didn't care and just pretended it was alive. One of them had almost snatched away a big part of him, so he had severed a part of himself so he couldn't be beached completely. The darkness was bigger in them. He would stay away from them now. He had quite liked that piece that once stole, but then again now he was even more mobile. Maybe less stable, but more mobile. He wouldn't risk it again, though. Only because he had made good out of bad didn't mean it was good in the first place. Who knew how complete and mobile he could have become? But hanging on to that thought would mean he would beat himself. No sense in that. And then there were the big ones. The others kept alternating and praising them or hating them when the dark feeling took over. And they wanted him to stay away from them. He thought it would be nice to become like them. They, were, they weren't beached. They still swam in the stream. But they rode the waves like experts, changing smoothly with each breaking wave and they had taken on the color of the stream itself. They were beautiful, and powerful and graceful and their limbs that they had limbs that functioned. 
Those limbs might look very different than the ones they originally had, which had been torn away. But each time that happened, they grew new ones from the stream, took from the stream what they needed, and the stream gladly yielded it to them. They never crippled anyone else with what they took. But somehow, when they took, they made more and gave back, remolded, and what became was more than what had ever been there before. They were much bigger and much prettier than the others, and every time he pointed that out to the others, the darkness grew in them, and they called the beautiful new limbs growths and tried to make the big ones look smaller. He could sense that it amused and hurt the big ones at the same time, but not in the way the others were wanted. The big ones felt regret and pity for the others, and occasionally anger when the others heard what was still in the stream. But they were never taken off course by the others, and the darkness in the others grew even more. Very seldom one of the others asked one of the big ones to take them for a swim, and when they did, the darkness receded and the others became a bit more colorful themselves. But they often succumbed to fear at the first wave and immediately beached themselves again. It was tragic when they did so after they had torn a limb off, but before they had grown a wondrous new one again, that was why the big ones didn't force them to swim. Their own fear of regrowing could leave them worse off than they had been before the swim. You had to be ready to stay for a while for it to benefit you. When you couldn't fight it, you had to ride the wave. The others always pointed out to those crippled ones to show him how dangerous it was to try to become a big one. They told him he would never be a big one. He should just accept it. If he wanted to become one anyway, they told him he had delusions and they laughed at him. But when they did so, he could always see that darkness growing inside as well. It was almost as if they laughed at him to keep the darkness at bay. One of the big ones had told him that was called jealousy. He thought it paralyzed them even more than a ripped off limb would. He didn't want it inside him. They said he was young and he didn't know what he was talking about, but secretly he decided that he would stay in the stream. He would try to become one a big one too, or he would die trying. Anything was better than to be wedged in on that beach and see the rainbow stream past without being able to join in. Some of the others didn't even see it anymore. They told everyone it was a figment of their imagination and that they should grow up. They faced away from the beach. Their splatters were almost dry. And what was still wet was poisoned. And the darkness consumed them. No, he would rather be ripped apart than to become like that. And hey, maybe the big ones had started like that. Like he had. Maybe it was a process. Maybe that was really what growing up was. And he would ride the waves, and he wouldn't try to hold on to one wave, at least not for too long so he would beach, but he would take them as they came, at least he would try very hard. It seemed to get easier the bigger you got, if you got there. But it was a goal worth pursuing. It was fun being a little universe of a life. Well, that was it for today. I hope you enjoyed yourself. And next time will be when they all come together. You've seen that a couple of the characters have already met. Now, you've met almost all the characters. You've met all the main characters now. But now comes the interplay of how they all fit together. And you will may have noticed that there are two or three different universes involved, or three different places involved. And that is going to be something that we get to next time.